I shall soon be quite dead at last. In spite of all, perhaps next month. Then it will be the month of April or of May. For the year is still young. A thousand little signs tell me so. Or perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps I shall survive St. John the Baptist's day. And even the 14th of July, festival of freedom. Indeed, I, I would not put it past me to pant on to the transfiguration, not to speak of the assumption. But I do not think so. I do not think I am wrong in saying that these rejoicing will take place in my absence this year. I have that feeling. I've had it now for some days, and I credit it. I could die today if I wished, merely by making a little effort. But it's just as well to let myself die quietly, without rushing things. Of course, I still have my little fits of impatience from time to time. I must be on my guard against them for the next fortnight or three weeks. Oh, without exaggeration, to be sure. Quietly crying and laughing. Without working myself up into a state. Yes. I shall be natural at last. I shall suffer more than less without drawing any conclusion. I shall pay less heed to myself. I shall be neither hot nor cold anymore. I shall be tepid. I shall die tepid without enthusiasm. I shall not watch myself die. That would spoil everything. Have I watched myself live? Have I ever complained? Then why rejoice now? I am content, necessarily, but not to the point of clapping my hands. I am satisfied. There, I am repaid. I have enough. I need nothing more. Let me say before I go any further that I forgive nobody. I wish them all an atrocious life and then the fires and ice of hell and in the execrable generations to come an honored name. <laughs> yeah, enough for this evening. This evening, we open our celebration with an anthology of classic moments from Beckett. His prose, his radio play, All That Fall, and his legendary Waiting for Godot. These performances reveal the resilient vein of humor at the heart of Beckett's work, no matter how tormented his characters, how extreme their predicaments. He was an uncompromising artist. He gave no interviews. He attempted no explanations. He preferred simply to keep working at his craft. He was meticulous about the detail of every production. He developed a deep friendship and rapport with a small group of directors and performers and supervised every facet of their work. I was privileged to work with him on many productions and it was a bit like working with a sculptor or a painter. It's as though he were drawing my character with a piece of charcoal and then he would take a rubber and rub most of it out. He would sometimes move one hand half an inch nearer my elbow and then take the other hand and move it half an inch away from my shoulder. Many of the famous productions were recorded in the radio and television studios of the BBC. And as Beckett looked on and helped to shape them, he relished the precision and the new dimensions these media would give to his work. While he said scarcely a word about the meaning of his work, a huge industry of explanation has built up around him. If we need a touchstone, perhaps we can find it in the citation of the Nobel Prize for Literature. 
It was awarded to Samuel Beckett in 1969 for a body of work that in new forms of fiction and theater has transmuted the destitution of modern man into his exaltation. Murphy's fourpenny lunch was a ritual vitiated by no base thoughts of nutrition. He advanced along the railings by easy stages until he came to a branch of the caterers he wanted. The sensation of the seat of a chair coming together with his drooping posteriors at last was so delicious that he rose at once and repeated the sit lingeringly and with intense concentration. Murphy did not so often meet with these tendernesses that he could afford to treat them casually. The second sit, however, was a great disappointment. The waitress stood before <clears throat> with an air of such abstraction that he didn't feel entitled to regard himself as an element in her situation. At last, seeing that she did not move, he said, Bring me... In the voice of an usher, resolved to order the chef's special selection for a school outing. He paused after this preparatory signal to let the four period develop. That first of three moments of reaction, which, according to the Culp School, the major torments of response are undergone. Then he applied the stimulus proper. A cup of tea and a packet of assorted biscuits. Tuppence the tea, tuppence the biscuits, a perfectly balanced meal. As though suddenly aware of the great magical ability, or it might have been the surgical quality, the waitress murmured before the eddies of the main period drifted her away, Vera to you, dear. This was not a caress. Vera concluded, as she thought, her performance in much better style than she'd begun. It was hard to believe, as she set down the tray, that it was the same slavey. She actually made out the bill there and then, on her own initiative. Murphy pushed the tray away, tilted back his chair, and considered his lunch with reverence and satisfaction. With reverence because, as an adherent on and off to the extreme theophanism of William of Champeau, he could not but feel humble before such sacrifices to his small but implacable appetite, nor omits the silent grace on this part of himself that I am about to ingest. May the Lord have mercy. With satisfaction, because the supreme moment in his degradations had come, the moment when, unaided and alone, he defrauded a vested interest. The sum involved was small, something between a penny and tuppence on the retail valuation. But then he had only fourpence worth of confidence to play with, his attitude simply was that if a swindle of from 25 to 50 percent of the outlay and effected while you wait was not a case of the large returns and quick turnover indicated by souk, then there was a serious flaw somewhere in his theory of sharp practice. But no matter how the transaction were judged from the economic point of view, nothing could detract from its merit as a little triumph of tactics in the face of the most fearful odds, only compare the belligerents. On the one hand, a colossal league of plutomanic caterers, highly endowed with the ruthless cunning of the sane, having at their disposal all the most deadly weapons of the post-war recovery. On the other, a seedy solipsist and fourpence. The seedy solipsist then, having said his silent grace and savoured his infamy in advance, drew up his chair briskly to the table, seized the cup of tea, and half emptied it at one gulp. No sooner had this gone to the right place than he began to splutter, eructate, and complain, as though he had been duped into swallowing a saturated solution of powdered glass. In this way, he attracted to himself the attention not only of every customer in the saloon, but actually of the waitress Vera who came running to get a good view of the accident, as she supposed. Murphy continued for a little to make sounds as of a flushing box taxed beyond its powers, and then said in an egg and scorpion voice, I ask for China, and you give me Indian. Though disappointed that it was nothing more interesting, Vera made no bones about making good her mistake. 
She was a willing little bit of sweated labor, incapable of betraying the slogan of her slavers that since the customer or sucker was paying for his gut rot ten times what it cost to produce and five times what it cost to fling in his face, it was only reasonable to defer to his complaints up to, but not exceeding, 50% of his exploitation. With the fresh cup of tea, Murphy adopted quite a new technique. He drank not more than a third of it, and then waited till Vera happened to be passing. I'm most fearfully sorry, he said, Vera, to give you this trouble. But do you think it would be possible to have this filled with hot? Vera, showing signs of bridling, Murphy uttered winningly the sesame. I know I'm a great nuisance, but they have been too generous with the cow juice. Generous and cow juice were the key words here. No waitress could hold out against their mingled overtones of gratitude and mammary organs. And Vera was essentially a waitress. That is the end of how Murphy defrauded a vested interest every day for his lunch to the honorable extent of paying for one cup of tea and consuming 1.83 cups, approximately. Try it sometime, gentle skimmer. What is the matter, Dan? Are you not well? Well? Did you ever know me to be well? The day you met me, I should have been in bed. The day you proposed to me, the doctors gave me up. You knew that, did you not? The night you married me, they came for me with an ambulance. You have not forgotten that, I suppose. No. I cannot be said to be well. But I am no worse. Indeed, I am better than I was. The loss of my sight was a great Philip. If I could go deaf and dumb, I think I might pant on to be a hundred. Or have I done so? Was I a hundred today? Am I a hundred, Maddie? All is still. No living soul in sight. There is no one to ask. The world is feeding. The wind scarcely stirs the leaves. And the birds are tired singing. The cows and the sheep ruminate in silence. The dogs hushed, and the hens spoil torpid in the dust. We are alone. There is no one to ask. <coughs> we drew out on the tick of time. I can vouch for that. I was... How can you vouch for it? I can vouch for it, I tell you. Do you want my relation or don't you? On the tick of time. I had the compartments to myself, as usual. At least I hope so. For I made no attempt to restrain myself. My mind... But why do we not sit down somewhere? Are we afraid we should never rise again? Sit down on what? Say on a bench, for example. There is no bench. Then on a bank. Let us sink down upon a bank. There is no bank. Then we cannot. I dream of other roads, in other lands, of another home, another... another home. What was I trying to say? Something about your mind. My mind? Are you sure? 
They mightn't. Oh, yes. Alone in the compartments, my mind began to work. As so often after office hours on the way home in the train to the lilt of the bogies. Your season ticket, I said, costs you twelve pounds a year. Now you earn on an average seven and six a day. That is to say, barely enough to keep you alive and twitching with the help of food, drink, tobacco and periodicals until you finally reach home and fall into bed. Add to this, or subtract from it, rent, stationery, various subscriptions, tram fares to and fro, light and heat, permits and licenses, hair trims and shaves, tips to escorts, upkeep of premises and appearances, and a thousand unspecifiable sundries, and it is clear that by lying at home in bed day and night, winter and summer, with a change of pajamas once a fortnight, you would add very considerably to your income. Business, I said. Did I hear a cry? Mrs. Tully, I fancy. Her poor husband is in constant pain and beats her unmercifully. That was a short knock. What was I trying to get at? Business. Ah, yes. Business. Business, old man, I said. Retire from business. It has retired from you. One has these moments of lucidity. I feel very cold and weak. On the other hand, I said, there are the horrors of home life. The dusting, sweeping, airing, scrubbing. Waxing, wailing, washing, mangling, drying, mowing, clipping, raking, rolling, scuffling, shoveling, grinding, tearing, pounding, banging, and slamming. And the brats, the happy little, healthy little, howling neighbor's brats. Of all this, and much more, the weekend, the Saturday intermission, and then the day of rest, have given you some idea... But what must it be like on a working day? A Wednesday? A Friday? What must it be like on a Friday? And I fell to thinking of my silent back street basement office with its obliterated plate, rest coach, and velvet hangings, and what it means to be buried there alive, if only from ten to five, with convenient to the one hand a bottle of light pale ale, and to the other a long, ice-cold fillet of hay. Nothing, I said, not even fully satisfied death, could ever take the place of that. It was then that I noticed we were at a standstill. Why are you hanging out at me like that? Have you swooned away? I feel very cold and faint. The wind is whistling through my summer frock as if I had nothing on over my bloomers. I have had no solid food since my elevenses. You have ceased to care. I speak, and you listen to the wind. No, no, I am a god. Tell me all. And then we shall press on and never pause. Never pause till we come safe to haven. Never pause. Say to Haven. Do you know, Maddie, sometimes one would think you were struggling with a dead language. Yes, indeed, Dan. I know full well what you mean. I often have that feeling. It is unspeakably excruciating. I confess, I sometimes have it myself. When I happen to overhear what I am saying. Oh, well, you know, it will be dead in time, just like our own poor dear Gaelic. There is that to be said. Good God. Oh, the pretty little woolly lamb crying to suck its mother. Theirs has not changed since Arcadine. Where was I in my composition? At a standstill. Ah, yes. <clears throat> I concluded naturally that we had entered a station and would soon be on our way again. And I sat on without misgiving. 
not sound. Things are very dull today, I said. Nobody getting down, nobody getting on. Then, as time flew by and nothing happened, I realized my error. We had not entered a station. Did you not spring up and poke your head out of the window? But what good would that have done me? Why, to call out to be told what was amiss. I did not care what was amiss. No, I just sat on saying, let us train for never to move again. I would not greatly mind. Then gradually, hey, how shall I say, a growing desire to, uh, you know, welled up within me. Nervous, probably. In fact, now I am sure. You know, the feeling of being confined. Yes, yes, I have been through that. If we sit here much longer, I said, I really do not know what I shall do. I got up and paced to and fro between the seats like a caged beast. That is a help sometimes. After what seemed an eternity, he simply moved off. The next thing was Barrel calling the abhorred name. I got down and Jerry led me to the men's. Or fever, as they call it now. From here, Virus, I suppose, the V becoming F in accordance with Prim's law. The rest, you know. You say nothing. Say something, Maddie. Say you believe me. I remember once attending a lecture by one of these new mind doctors. I forget what you call them. He spoke... A lunatic specialist. No, no. Just the troubled mind. I was hoping he might shed a little light on my lifelong preoccupation with horses' buttocks. A neurologist. No, no, just mental distress. The name will come back to me in the night. I remember his telling us the story of a little girl. Very strange and unhappy in her ways. And how he treated her unsuccessfully over a period of years and was finally obliged to give up the case. He could find nothing wrong with her, he said. The only thing wrong with her, as far as he could see, was that she was dying. And she did, in fact, die shortly after he had washed his hands of her. Well, what is there so wonderful about that? No. It was just something he said. And the way he said it. That have haunted me ever since. You lie awake at night, tossing to and fro, and brooding on it. On it and other wretchedness. When he had done with the little girl, he stood there motionless for some time, quite two minutes, I should say, looking down at his table. Then he suddenly raised his head and exclaimed, as if he had had a revelation, the trouble with her was she had never really been born. He spoke throughout without notes. I left before the end. Nothing about your buttocks. <laughs> Maddie. There is nothing to be done for those people. For which is there? That does not sound right, somehow. What way am I facing? What? I have forgotten what way I am facing. You have turned aside and are bowed down over the ditch. There was a dead dog down there. No, no. Just the rotting leaves. In June? Rotting leaves in June? Yes, dear. From last year. In the year before last. In the year before that again. I 
spent some time by the seaside without incident. For there are people the sea doesn't suit who prefer the mountains or the plains. But personally, I feel no worse off there than anywhere else. I took advantage of being at the seaside to lay in a store of sucking stones. Oh, there were pebbles, but I call them stones. Yes, on this occasion, I laid in a considerable store. I distributed them equally between my four pockets and sucked them, turn and turn about. Now, this raised a problem, which I first solved in the following way. I had, say, 16 stones, four on each of my four pockets, those being the two pockets of my trousers and the two pockets of my greatcoat. Taking a stone from the right pocket of my greatcoat and putting it in my mouth, I replaced it in the right pocket of my greatcoat by a stone from the right pocket of my trousers, which I replaced by a stone from the left pocket of my trousers, which I replaced by a stone from the left pocket of my greatcoat, which I replaced by the stone that was in my mouth as soon as I had finished sucking it. Thus, there were still four stones in each of my four pockets, but not quite the same stone. And when the desire to suck took hold of me again, I drew again on the right pocket of my greatcoat, certain of not taking the same stone as the last time, and as I sucked it, I rearranged the other stones in the way I have just described, and so on. But this solution did not satisfy me fully. For it did not escape me that by an extraordinary hazard, the four stones circulating thus might always be the same four. In which case, far from sucking 16 stones turn and turn about, I was really only sucking four, and always the same turn and turn about. But I... I I shuffled them well in my pockets before I began to suck, and again while I sucked before transferring, in the hope of obtaining a more general circulation of the stones from pocket to pocket. It was only a makeshift. and could not not content a man like me. So I began to look for something else. And the first thing I hit upon was that I might do better to transfer the stones four by four instead of one by one. That is to say, during the sucking, to take the three stones remaining in the right pocket of my greatcoat and replace them by the four on the right pocket of my trousers, and these by the four on the left pocket of my trousers, and these by the four on the left pocket of my greatcoat, and finally these by the three from the right pocket of my greatcoat, plus the one that was in my mouth as soon as I had finished sucking it. Yes. It seemed to me at first that by so doing, I would arrive at a better result. But on further reflection, I had to change my mind and confess that the circulation of the stones four by four came to exactly the same thing as their circulation one by one. For if I was certain of finding each time in the right pocket of my greatcoat four stones totally different from their immediate predecessors, the possibility nevertheless remained of my always chancing on the same stone within each group of four. I'm consequently of my sucking, not the 16 stones turn and turn about as I wished, but in fact four only, and always the same turn and turn about. Oh, damn the hell with it. So I had to seek elsewhere than in the mode of circulation. For no matter how I caused my stones to circulate, I always ran the same risk. Oh, it was obvious that by increasing the number of my pockets, I was bound to increase the chances of enjoying my stones in the way I had planned. That is to say, one after the other until their number was exhausted. Had I had eight pockets now instead of the four I did have, even the most diabolical hazard could not have prevented me from sucking at least eight of my 16 stones turn and turn about. The truth is, I should have needed 16 pockets in order to be quite easy in my mind. And for a long time, I could come to no other conclusion than this. And short of having 16 pockets, each with its own stone, I could never reach the goal I had set myself, short of an extraordinary hazard. And even a pinch, I was a double the number of my pockets. But it only by dividing each pocket in two with the help of a few safety pins, let us say, to quadruple them, <laughs> more than I could manage. And I did not feel inclined to take all that trouble for a half measure. For I was beginning to lose all sense of measure after all this wrestling and wrangling. 
and to say all or nothing. I finally reached a solution. Inelegant, assuredly, but sound. Sound. All, all that was necessary was to put, for example, to begin with, six stones in the right pocket of my great coat and supply pocket, five in the right pocket of my trousers, and five in the left pocket of my trousers. Now that makes a lot. Twice five, ten, plus six, sixteen. And none, for none remained in the left pocket of my great coat, which for the time being remained empty. Good. Now I can begin to suck. Watch me closely. I take a stone from the right pocket of my great coat, suck it, stop sucking it, put it in the left pocket of my great coat, the one empty. I take a second stone from the right pocket of my great coat, suck it, put it in the left pocket of my great coat, and so on, until the right pocket of my great coat is empty, and the five stones, six stones I have just sucked, are all in the left pocket of my great coat. Pausing then. And concentrating. So as not to make a balls of it. I transfer to the right pocket of my great coat, in which there are no stones left, the five stones in the right pocket of my trousers, which I replace by the five stones in the left pocket of my trousers, which I replace by the six stones in the left pocket of my great coat. At this stage, then, the left pocket of my great coat is again empty, and the right pocket of my great coat is again supplied, and in the right way. That is to say, with other stones than those I have just sucked. These other stones I then begin to suck one after the other and to transfer as I go along to the left pocket of my greatcoat, being absolutely certain. As far as one can be in an affair of this kind, that I am not sucking the same stones as a moment before but others. And when the right pocket of my greatcoat is again empty and the five stones I have just sucked one after the other are all, without exception, in the left pocket of my greatcoat, then I proceed to the same redistribution as a moment before, or similar redistribution. That is to say, I transfer to the right pocket of my greatcoat once again available, the five stones in the right pocket of my trousers, which I replace by the six stones in the left pocket of my trousers, which I replace by the five stones in the left pocket of my greatcoat. And there I am, ready to begin again. Do I have to go on? No. But it is clear after the next series of sucks and transfers, I shall be back to where I started. That is to say, with the first six stones back in the supply pocket, the next five in the right pocket of my stinking old trousers, and finally the last five in the left pocket of same. And my 16 stones will have been sucked once at least, in impeccable succession. Not one sucked twice, not one left unsucked. <laughs> but deep down, I didn't give a tinker's curse. It was all the same to me whether I sucked a different stone each time or always the same stone till the end of time. But they all tasted exactly the same. And if I had collected 16, it wasn't to suck them turn and turn about but simply to have a little store, so as never to be without. <laughs> Deep down, I didn't give a fiddler's damn about being without. When they were all gone, they would be all gone, and I wouldn't be any the worse off, or hardly any. So the solution to which I rallied in the end was to throw away all the stones but one, which I kept now in one pocket, now in another, which I, of course, soon lost or gave away, or threw away, or swallowed.
A dog... <coughs> a dog ran into the kitchen and stole the crust of bread. The cook got with the ladle and beat it till he was dead. Then all the dogs came running and dug the dog a tomb. And all the dogs came running and dug the dog a tomb and wrote upon the tombstone for the eyes of dogs to come. A dog ran into the kitchen and stole the crust of bread, the cook up with the ladle and beat it till he was dead. Then all the dogs came running and dug the dog a tomb. And all the dogs came running and dug the dog a tomb. Dug the dog a tomb. You again. Come here till I embrace you. Don't touch me. You want me to go away? Go, go. Did they beat you? Where did you spend the night? Don't touch me. Don't question me. Don't speak to me. Stay with me. Did I ever leave you? You let me go. Look at me. Will you look at me? <laughs> what a day. Who beat you? Tell me. Another day done with. Not yet. For me, it's over and done with no matter what happens. I heard you singing. That's right. I remember. That finished me. I said, there he is all alone. He thinks I've gone forever and he sings. One is not master of one's moods. All day I've been in great form. I didn't get up in the night. Not once. You see, you piss better when I'm not there. I missed you. And at the same time, I was happy. Now, isn't that a queer thing? Happy? Well, perhaps that's not the right word. And now? And now, there you are again. There we are again. There I am again. You see, you feel worse when I'm with you. But all the same, you must be happy yourself, deep down, if you did but know it. Happy about what? To be with me again. Would you say so? Well, say you are, even if it's not true. What shall I say? Say, I am happy. I am happy. So am I. So am I. We are happy. We are happy. Oh, what do we do now, now that we're happy? We wait for God. Oh. Things have changed here since yesterday. And if he doesn't come? Oh, we'll see you when the time comes. We're saying things have changed here since yesterday. Everything oozes. Look at the tree. It's never the same pass from one second to the next. The tree. Look at the tree. Was it not there yesterday? Well, of course it was there yesterday. Do you not remember? We nearly hanged ourselves from it, but you wouldn't. Is it possible you've forgotten already? That's the way I am. Either I forget immediately or I never forget and Pozzo and Lucky. Have you forgotten them, too? Pozzo and Lucky. He's forgotten everything. I remember a lunatic who nearly kicked the shins off me, then he played the fool. That was Lucky. I remember that. But when was it? And his keeper. He gave not... me a boat. That was Pozzo. And all that was yesterday, you say? Of course it was yesterday. And here, where we are now? Well, where else do you think? You do not recognize the place. Recognize? What is there to recognize? All my life in life I've crawled about in the muck. And you talk to me about scenery. Look at this muck heap. I've never stirred from it. Calm yourself. Calm yourself. You and your landscapes. Tell me about the worms. 
All the same, you can't say that this bears any resemblance to the Macon country, for example. You can't deny that there's a great difference. The Macon country? Who's talking to you about the Macon country? But you were there yourself in the Macon country. No, I was never in the Macon country. I puked my puke of a life away here, I tell you, here. In the Tacon country. Ah, <sighs> oh, you're a hard man to get on with, Coco. It'd be better if we parted. You always say that, and you always come crawling back. It'd be best if you killed me like the other. What other? What other? Like billions of others. To every man his little cross. Until he dies. And is forgotten. In the meantime, let us try and converse calmly. Since we are incapable of keeping silent. You're right. We're inexhaustible. It's so we won't think. We have that excuse. It's so we won't hear. We have our reasons. All the dead voices. They make a noise like wings. Like leaves. Like sand. Like leaves. They all speak together. Each one to itself. Rather, they whisper. They rustle. They murmur. They rustle. What do they say? Talk about their lives. To have lived is not enough for them. They must talk about it. To be dead is not enough for them. It is not sufficient. They make a noise like feathers. Like leaves. Like ashes. Like leaves. Say something. Try. Say anything at all. What do we do now? We wait for God. Ah. This is awful. Sing something. No, 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 no. We'll have to think of something different. Let me see. Let me see. Ah, 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 Well, what was I saying? We could go on from there. What were you saying when? Uh, in the beginning. In the beginning of what? Well, this evening I was saying, I was saying... I'm not a historian. Ah, uh, we met, we embraced. We embraced. We were happy. Uh, what will we do now that we're happy? Uh, wait a minute, it's coming. Uh, uh, wait, we go on waiting. It's coming. Ah, the tree. The tree? Do you not remember? I'm tired. Look at it. I see nothing. But yesterday it was all black and bare. Now it's covered with leaves. Leaves? In a single night. Must be the spring. But in a single night? I tell you, we weren't here yesterday. Another of your nightmares. Then where were we yesterday evening, according to you? How do I know? In another compartment. There's no lack of void. Good. Then we were not here yesterday evening. What did we do yesterday evening? Do. Try and remember. Do. I suppose we're glad About what? Oh, I don't know. Nothing in particular. Yes! Now I remember. Yesterday evening we spent blathering about nothing in particular. That's been going on now for half a century. And you don't remember any fact, any circumstance? Don't torment me, did he? The sun, the moon, do you not remember? I suppose they must have been there as usual. Pozzo, unlucky. Pozzo? The bones. They were like fish bones. It was Pozzo gave them to you. I don't know. And the kick? That's right, come and kick me. It was Lucky gave you that. And all that was yesterday. <sighs> Show your leg. Which? Both. Pull up your trousers. Pull up your trousers. I can't. The other. The other. Pig. There's the wound. And it's beginning to fester. And what about it? Uh, where are your boots? I must have thrown them away. When? I don't know. Why? I don't know why I don't know. 
No, I mean, why did you throw them away? Because they were hurting me. <sighs> there they are. In the very spot where you left them yesterday. They're not mine. Not yours. Mine were black. These are brown. Are you sure yours are black? Well, a kind of grey. And those are brown? Sure. What a kind of green. Sure. Well, of all that... You see, all that's a lot of bloody... I see it. I see what happened. All that's a lot of bloody... It's elementary. Somebody came and took yours and left you his. Why? Because his were too tight for him. So he took yours. But mine were too tight for you. Not for him. I'm tired. Let's go. We can't. Why not? We're waiting for God. Ah. What do we do? What do we do? Nothing to do. But I can't go on like this. Would you like a radish? Is that all there is? There's radishes and turnips. Are there no carrots? No. In any case, you overdo it with your carrots. Well, give me a radish. It's black. It's a radish. I only like the pink ones, you know that. You don't want it. I only like the pink ones. Well, give it to me back. I'll go and get a carrot. You know, this is becoming really insignificant. Not enough. What about trying them? I've tried everything. No, I mean the boots. Would that be a good thing? It would pass the time. I can assure you it would be an occupation. A relaxation. A recreation. A relaxation. Then you'll try. You'll help me. I will, of course. <laughs> we don't manage too badly, eh, did it, between the two of us? Yes, yes, yes. Try the left one, huh? We always manage to find something, eh, did it, to give us the impression we exist. Yes, yes. We're magicians. But let us persevere in what we have resolved before we forget. Ah, give me your foot. The other, hog. Try and walk. Ah! Oh! Ah! Well, it fits. Good, then we'll try and lace it. No, no, no laces, no laces. You'll be sorry. We'll try the other one. Well, if it's too. It doesn't hurt. Not yet. Then you'll keep them. They're too big. You may have socks one day. True. Then you'll keep them. That's enough about these boots. But, you know! Suppose I might as well sit down. That's where you were sitting yesterday. I could only sleep. Yesterday you slept. I'll try. Wait. 
Bye, 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 bye. Not so loud. Bye, 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 I was falling. It's all over, I tell you. I was on top. Uh, don't tell me. Hmm? Come. Let's walk it off. Huh? Oh, that's enough. I'm tired. And you'd rather just be stuck there doing nothing? Yes. Well, please yourself. Let's go. We can't. Why not? We're waiting for God, though. Ah. <clears throat> Can you not stay still? I'm cold. We came too soon. It always happens at night, Paul. The night doesn't fall. It'll fall suddenly, like yesterday. Then it'll be night. And then we can go. Then it'll be day again. What'll we do? What'll we do? Will you stop your whining? I've had about my belly full of your lamentations. I'm going. Well. Farewell. Lucky's hat. I've been here an hour and I never saw it. Fine. You'll never see me again. I knew we were in the right place. Now our troubles are over. Must have been a very fine hat. Mm -hmm. Here. What? Hold that. How does it fit me? How would I know? No, I mean, uh, how do I look? Hideous. But not more than usual. Neither more nor less. Then I'll keep it. Because mine irked me. Or I have to say, it itched me. I'm going. But will you not play? Play what? Uh, we could play Lucky and Pozzo. Never heard of it. You, I'll be Lucky, and you'll be Pozzo. Well, go on. What do I do? Curse me. Naughty. Stronger. Gonna cock a sparkit. Tell me to think. What? Say think, pig. Think, pig. Oh, I can't. That's enough of that. Tell me to dance. I'm going. Dance, hog. Ah, oh, I can't. Go, go. Hmm. 
<laughs> ah, there you are again at last. I'm cursed. Where have you been? I thought you'd gone forever. They're coming. Who? I don't know. How many? I don't know. Go, go. It's God, though. God, though, at last we're saved. Let's go and meet him. <laughs> Come back. Ah, uh, there you are again, again. I'm in hell. Ah, oh, where were you? They're coming there too. We're surrounded. <laughs> not up there, imbecile. There's no way out there. <laughs> quick, look. There's not a soul in sight there. Off you go, quick. <laughs> you won't? I can understand that. Let me see. <laughs> Your only hope left is to disappear. Where? Behind the tree. <gasps> Behind the tree. <clears throat> Quick. <clears throat> Decidedly, this tree will not have been of the slightest use to us. I lost my head. Forgive me, it won't happen again. Tell me what to do. There's nothing to do. You stand over there. There, stand there and watch out. Back to back, like in the good old days. You see anything coming? What? You see anything coming? No. All right. You must have had a vision. What? You must have had a vision. There's no need to shout. You? Do you... Pardon. Carry on. No, after you. No, no, you first. No, I interrupted you. On the contrary. Ceremonious. A punctilious pig. Finish your phrase, I'll tell you. Finish it out. Moron. That's the idea. Let's abuse each other. Moron. Vermin. Abortion. Morpion. Sewer rat. Curate. Cretin. Critic. Now let's make it up. Yes. Go, go. Edie. Your hand. Take it. Come to my arms. Your arms? My breast. Off we go. <sighs> How time flies when one has fun. What do we do now? Let's do the tree, just for the balance. The tree? Yes. Your turn. Do you think God sees me? You must close your eyes. God! Have pity on me! And me! On me! On me! Pity on me! Go, go! What is it? Who is it? It's a God at last. Reinforcements at last. How is it, Godo? We were beginning to weaken, but now we're sure to see the evening out. Pity! Poor Pozzo. I knew it was him. Who? Godo. It's not Godo. Not Godo. It's not Godo. Then who is it? It's Pozzo. Here! Here! Help he, me out! He can't get up. Let's go. We can't. Why not? We're waiting for Godo. Ah. Hey. 
Perhaps he has another bone for you. Bone? Chicken. Do you not remember? It was him? Yes. Ask him. Well, perhaps you'd better help him first. To do what? To get up. He can't get up. He wants to get up. Then let him get up. He can't get up. Why not? I don't know. Uh... Let us ask him for the bone first, and if he refuses, leave him there. You mean we have him at our mercy? Yes. And we should subordinate our good offices to certain conditions? What? Yeah, that seems intelligent, all right. But there's one thing I'm afraid of. Help! What? That Lucky may get going at any minute. Then we're bollocksed. Lucky? Lucky. The one that went for you yesterday. I tell you, there were ten of them. No, no, before that, he was the one that kicked you. <clears throat> Is he there? As large as life. At the moment, he is in a... At any moment, he may get going. Help! And if we gave him a good beating, the two of us. You mean if we fell on him in his sleep? Yes. Hmm, that seems a good idea. But could we do it? Is he really asleep? No. The best would be to take advantage of Pozzo asking for help. Help! To help him. We help him. In anticipation of some tangible return. And suppose... Let he... us not waste time in idle discourse. Let us do something while we have the chance. It is not every day that we are needed. So let's make the most of it before it is too late. Let us represent worthily for once the foul brood to which a cruel fate consigned us. What do you say? It I... is true that when with folded arms we weigh the pros and cons, we are no less a credit to our species. The tiger bounds to the aid of his congeners without the least reflection, or else he slinks away into the depths of the thickets. But that is not the question. What are we doing here? That is the question. And we are blessed in this that we happen to know the answer. For in all this immense confusion, one thing alone is clear. We are waiting for Gardo to come. Ah, uh, help! Or for night to fall. We have kept our appointment, and that is an end to that. We are not saints, but we have kept our appointment. And how many people can boast as much? Billions. You think so? I don't know. You may be right. All I know is that the hours are long under these conditions and constrain us to consign them with proceedings which, how shall I say, which at first sight may seem reasonable and so they become a habit. You may say it is to prevent our reason from foundering, but has it not long been straying in the night without end of the abyssal depths? That's what I sometimes wonder. Help! You follow my reasoning. We all are born mad. Some remain so. I'll pay you! How much? One hundred francs! Not enough. Oh, I wouldn't go as far as that. You think it's enough? No, as far as to assert that I was weak in the head when I came into this world. But that is not the question. Two hundred! We wait. We are bored. Yet, no, no, don't interrupt. We are bored to death and there's no denying it. Good! A diversion comes along and what do we do? We let it go to waste. Let us get to work. In an instant, all will vanish, and we shall be alone once more in the midst of nothingness. Two hundred! We're coming! <laughs> with you all. Help! I'm going. Don't leave me. They'll kill me. Where am I? Go, go. Help! Help! I'm going. Help me up. We'll go together. You promise? I promise. And we'll never come back? Never. We'll go to the Pyrenees? Yeah, anywhere you like. I've always wanted to wander in the Pyrenees. You'll wander in them. <laughs> Who farted? Pot so. Here! Here! Pity! It's revolting. Give me a hand. 
I'm going. Oh, well. I'm going. I suppose I'll get up myself. In the fullness of time. What's the matter with you? Go to hell. Are you staying there? Well, for the time being. Come on, get up. You'll catch a chill. Oh, don't worry about me. Oh, come on, Diddy. Don't be pig-headed. Uh, oh! Ah! Oh! Ah! We've arrived. Who are you? We are men. Sweet mother earth. Uh, Can you get up? I don't know. Try. Not now, not now. What happened? You stop it, you pest. He thinks of nothing but himself. What about a little snooze? Did you hear that? He wants to know what happened. Oh, never mind him. Sleep. What is it? Are you sleeping? I must have been. This bastard popped so at it again. Well, make him stop and kick him in the crotch. Will you stop it, crab blasting it? Stop it! Ah! I say, I say, uh, help! Help! He's off. Help! Help! He's down. What do we do now? Maybe I could crawl to him. Don't leave me. Or I could call to him. Yes, call to him. Fatso! Fatso! No reply. Together. Fatso! Fatso! He moved. Are you sure his name is Fatso? Oh. Mr. Fatso, come back. We won't hurt you. Perhaps we could try him with other names. I'm afraid he's dying. It'd be amusing. What would be amusing? To try with other names, one after the other, to pass the time, and we're bound to hit on the right one in the end. I tell you, his name is Potso. We'll soon see. Abel! Abel! Help! Not in one. Hmm. I'm beginning to weary of this motif. Perhaps the other's called Cain. Cain! Cain! Help! He's all humanity. Look at the little cloud. There. There, in the zenith. Well, what's so wonderful about it? Let's pass on now to something else. Do you mind? I was about to suggest that. But to what? Ah. Uh, suppose we get up to begin with. Well, it's worth trying. Mm. Child's play. Simple matter of willpower. And now? Help! Let's go. We can't. Why not? We're waiting for God. Ah. Oh, what do we do? What do we do? Help! What about helping him? What does he want? He wants to get up. Why doesn't he? He wants us to help him get up. Then why don't we? What are we waiting for? Oh. We must hold him. Ah. Ah. Feeling better? Who are you? Do you not recognize us? I am blind. Perhaps he can see into the future. Since when? I used to have wonderful sight. But are you friends? <laughs> he wants to know if we're friends. He means friends of his. Well? Well, we proved we are by helping him. Exactly. Would we have helped him if we weren't his friends? Possibly. True. We won't quibble about that now. You are not highwaymen. Highwaymen? Do we look like highwaymen? Damn it, man. Can't you see the man is blind? Damn it. So he is. So he says. Don't leave me. No question of it. For the moment. How do you feel now? How much longer once we cart him around? <laughs> oh. <clears throat> we are not... Karyakids. You were saying that your sight used to be good, if I heard you right. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful sight. Expand, expand. Let him alone. Can't you see he's thinking of the days when he was happy? Memoria preteritorum bonorum. That must be unpleasant. We wouldn't know. 
Did it come on you all of a sudden? Quite wonderful. I was asking you if it came on you all of a sudden. I woke up one fine day as blind as fortune. Sometimes I wonder if I'm not still asleep. And when was that? I don't know. But no later than yesterday. Don't question me! The blind have no notion of time. The things of time are hidden from them, too. Well, fancy that. I could have sworn it would be just the opposite. Some diversion. Uh, where is my menial? He's around somewhere. Why doesn't he answer when I call? It seems to me he's sleeping. Uh, maybe he's dead. What happened exactly? Exactly. The two of you slipped and fell. Go and see, is he hurt? Oh, he can't leave you. You needn't both go. No, you go. After what he did to me, never. Yes, yes, let your friend go. He stinks so. What is he waiting for? What are you waiting for? I'm waiting for Godot. What exactly should he do? Well, to begin with, he should pull on the rope as hard as he likes, so long as he doesn't strangle him. He usually responds to that. If not, he should give him a taste of his boot in the face and privates, as far as possible. Yeah, you see, you've nothing to be afraid of. And it's even an opportunity for you to revenge yourself. And if he defends himself? No, no, he never defends himself. And I'll come flying to the rescue. Don't take your eyes off me. Wait! Make sure he's alive before you start. There's no point in exerting yourself if he's dead. He's breathing. Let him have it. Wait! gone wrong now. I think my friend has hurt himself. And Lucky? Then it is he. Who? Lucky. I don't understand. And you are Pozzo. Certainly I am Pozzo. The same as yesterday. Yesterday? We met yesterday. Do you not remember? I don't remember having met anyone yesterday, but tomorrow I won't remember having met anyone today, so don't count on me to enlighten you. But enough! Up, pig! But you're bringing him to the fair to sell him. You spoke to us. He thought he danced. You had your sight. As you please. Let me go. Up! And where do you go from here? On. What have you got in the bag? Sand. On. Don't go yet. I'm going. What will you do if you fall far from help? We wait till we can get up, then we go on. On. Roy, before you go, tell him to sing. Who? Lucky. To sing? Yes, or to think or recite. But he's dumb. Dumb? Dumb. He can't even groan. Dumb? Since when? Have you not done tormenting me with your accursed time? It's abominable. When? When? One day. Is that not enough for you? One day like any other day. One day he went dumb. One day I went blind. One day we'll go deaf. One day we were born. One day we shall die. The same day, the same second. Is that not enough for you? They give birth astride of a grave. The light gleams an instant. Then it's night once more. Oh, 
<laughs> ah! Why will you never let me sleep? I felt lonely. I was dreaming I was happy. Well, that passed the time. I was dreaming. Don't tell me. I wonder, was he really blind? Blind who? Pozzo. Blind? He told us he was blind. Well, what about it? It seemed to me that he saw us. Oh, you dreamt it. Let's go. Oh, we can't. Uh, are you sure it wasn't him? Who? Goddo. But who? Pozzo. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Well, I might as well get up. Oh! I don't know what to think anymore. I'm being help me. Help. Was I sleeping while the others suffered? Am I still sleeping? And when I wake up tomorrow, or think I do, what shall I say of today? With Estragon, my friend, in this place, until the fall of night, I waited for Gotto. The Pozzo passed with his carrier and spoke to us. Probably. But in all that, what truth will there be? He'll know nothing. He'll tell me of the blows he's received, and I'll give him a carrot. The stride of a grave and a difficult birth. Down in the hole, lingeringly, the grave digger puts on the forceps. We have time to grow old. The air is full of our cries. But habit is a great deadener. At me, too, someone is looking. Of me, too, someone is saying, he is sleeping. He knows nothing. Let him sleep on. I can't go on. What have I said? Mister? Mr. Albert? Off we go again. Do you not recognize me? No, sir. It wasn't you came yesterday. No, sir. This is your first time. Yes, sir. You have a message from Mr. Goddo. Yes, sir. He won't be coming this evening. No, sir. But he'll be coming tomorrow. Yes, sir. Without fail. Yes, sir. What does he do, Mr. Goddo? Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Well? He does nothing, sir. How is your brother? He's sick, sir. Perhaps it was he came yesterday. I don't know, sir. Has he a beard, Mr. Goddo? Yes, sir. Is it fair or black? I think it's white, sir. Christ have mercy on us. What am I to tell Mr. Goddo, sir? Tell him. Tell him that you saw me and that... that you saw me. You're sure you saw me? You won't come back tomorrow and tell me you never saw me? What's wrong with you? Nothing. I'm going. So am I. Did I sleep long? I don't know. Where shall we go? Not far. Oh, yes, let's go far away from here. 
We can't. Why not? We have to come back tomorrow. What for? To wait for Goddard. Ah. Oh. He didn't come? No. And now it's too late? Yes. Now it's night. And if we dropped him? If we dropped him? He'd punish us. Everything's dead but the tree. What is it? It's the tree. I know. Yes, but what kind? I don't know. A willow. Why don't we hang ourselves? With what? You haven't got a bit of rope? No. And we can't. Let's go. Wait! There's my belt. No, it's, it's too short. You can hang on to my leg. Well, who'd hang off the mine? True. Show, just the same. <laughs> hmm, might do it a pinch. Do you think it would be strong enough? We'll see, we'll see. Huh? Not worth a curse. You say we have to come back tomorrow? Yes. Then we could bring a good bit of rope. Yes. Did he? Yes. I can't go on like this. That's what you think. If we parted, it might be better for us. We'll hang ourselves tomorrow. Unless God will come. And if he comes? We're saved. Well, here we go. Pull on your trousers. What? Pull on your trousers. You want me to pull off my trousers? Pull on your trousers. True. Well, shall we go? Yeah. Let's go. Our celebration of the work of Samuel Beckett continues on Wednesday with performances by two outstanding interpreters of his work. First, Patrick McGee in the play specially written for him, Crap's Last Tape. Just been listening to that stupid bastard I took myself for 30 years ago. Hard to believe I was ever as bad as that. Well, thank God that's all done with anyway. And Jack McGarren is the tortured figure in Ajo, haunted by the voice of Sean Phillips. Anyone living love you now, Joe? Anyone living sorry for you now? That slut that comes on Saturday, you pay her, don't you? Penny a hoist, tuppence as long as you like. Watch yourself you don't run short, Joe. Ever think of that? Hey, Joe. Awake for Sam continues on Wednesday at 9.25. The news and sports on BBC One well, in a moment. To... Our celebration continues this evening with two of Beckett's one-act plays, Crap's Last Tape and A. Joe. Each features one of Beckett's favourite interpreters, Jack McGowan as Joe, Patrick McGee as Crap. Beckett had heard McGee's unique, cracked voice on the radio, and he wrote the part of Crap especially for him. The play opened at the Royal Court Theatre in 1958. McGee's definitive performance was recorded for the BBC in 1972 by the original stage director, Donald McQuinney.
again. Ah. Box three, spoon five. Box three, 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 four, two. Hmm. The black ball. Black ball. The dark nerd. Slight improvement in foul condition. Hmm. Memorable. Wow. 
equinox. Memorable equinox. Memorable equinox. Farewell to love. Thirty-nine today. Sound is up. Thirty-nine today, sound as a bell. Apart from my old weakness, and intellectually, I have now every reason to suspect at the crest of the wave, or thereabouts. Celebrated the awful occasion as in recent years, quietly at the wine house. Not a soul. Sat before the fire with closed eyes, separating the brain from the husk. I jotted down a few notes on the back of an envelope. Good to be back in my den, in my old rags. Have just eaten, I regret to say, three bananas, and only with difficulty refrained from a fall. Fatal things for a man of my condition. Cut them out. The new light above my table is a great improvement, with all this darkness round me, I feel less alone, in a way. I love to get up and move about in it, then back here to me. Crap. The grain. Now, what I wonder do I mean by that? I mean... I suppose I mean those things worth having when all the dust has... when all my dust has settled. I close my eyes and try and imagine them. Extraordinary silence this evening. I strain my ears and do not hear a sound. Old Miss McGloam always sings at this hour but not tonight. Songs of her girlhood, she says. Hard to think of her as a girl. Wonderful woman, though. Connaught, I fancy. Shall I sing when I am her age, if I ever am? No. Did I sing as a boy? No. Did I ever sing? No. I've just been listening to an old year, passages at random. I didn't check in the book, but it must be at least ten or twelve years ago. At that time, I think I was still living on and off with Bianca in Kida Street. Well, out of that, Jesus, yes, hopeless business. Not much about her, apart from a tribute to her eyes. Very warm. I suddenly saw them again. Incomparable. Oh, well. These old PMs are gruesome, but I often find them... ahead before embarking on a new retrospect. Hard to believe I was ever that young whelp, the voice, Jesus, and the aspirations, <laughs> and the resolutions, <laughs> to drink less in particular, <laughs> statistics. Seventeen hundred hours out of the preceding eight thousand odd consumed on licensed premises alone, more than twenty percent, say forty percent of his waking life. Plans for a less 
engrossing sexual life. Last illness of his father, flagging pursuit of happiness, unattainable laxation, sneers at what he calls his youth, and thanks to God it's over. False ring there. Shadows of the opus magnum. Closing with the... <laughs> yep to Providence. <laughs> <laughs> what remains of all that misery? A girl in a shabby green coat on a railway station platform? No. When I look, on the year that has gone with what I hope is perhaps a glint of the old eye to come. There is, of course, the house on the canal where Mother lay a dying in the late autumn after her long viduity, and the... A dying after her long viduity, and the... State or condition of being or remaining a widow or widower. Being or remaining. Deep weeds of viduity. Also of an animal, especially a bird. The viduba or weaver bird. Black plumage of May. The lady you are burned. Bench by the weir, from where I could see her window. There I sat in the biting wind, wishing she were gone. Hardly so, just a few regulars, nursemaids, infants, old men, dogs. I got to know them quite well. Or oh, by appearance, of course, I mean. One dark young beauty I recollect particularly, all white and starch, incomparable bosom, with a big black hooded perambulator, most funereal figure. Whenever I looked in her direction, she had her eyes on me, and yet when I was bold enough to speak to her, 
not having been it produced, she threatened to call a policeman. As if I had designs on her virtue. Hmm? <laughs> face she had, the eyes like crystal light. Oh, well. I was there when... The blind went down. One of those dirty brown roller affairs throwing a ball for a little white dog, as chance would have it. I happened to look up, and there it was, all over and done with at last. I sat on for a few moments with the ball in my hand and the dog yelping and pawing at me. Moments. Her moments. My moments. Dog's moments. In the end, I held it out to him, and he took it in his mouth. Gently, gently. A small, old, black, hard, solid rubber ball. I shall feel it in my hand until my dying day. I might have kept it, but I gave it to the dog. Ah, oh, well. Spiritually, a year of profound gloom and indigence, until that memorable night in March at the end of the jetty in the howling wind, never to be forgotten, when suddenly I saw the whole thing, the vision at last. This, I fancy, is what I have chiefly to record this evening against the day when my work will be done and perhaps no place left in my memory, warm or cold, for the miracle that... for the fire that set it alight. What I suddenly saw then was this, that the belief I had been going on all my life, namely... Great granite rocks, the foam flying up in the light of the lighthouse and the wind gauge spinning like a propeller, clear to me at last that the dark I have always struggled to keep under is in reality my most... Unshatterable association until my dissolution of storm and night with the light of the understanding of the fire... <laughs> My face in her breasts and my hand on her. We lay there without moving, but under us all moved and moved us gently up and down and from side to side. Past midnight, never knew such silence. The earth might be uninhabited. Here I end. Upper Lake with the punt. Bathed off the bank, then pushed out into the stream and drifted. She lay stretched out on the floorboards with her hands under her head, her eyes closed. Sun blazing down, a bit of a breeze, water nice and lively. I noticed a scratch on her thigh and asked her how she came by it. Picking gooseberry, she said. I said again I thought it was hopeless and no good going on, and she agreed, without opening her eyes. I asked her to look at me, 
And after a few moments, after a few moments, she did. But the eyes just slit because of the glare. I bent over her to get him in the shadow. And they opened. Let me in. We drifted in among the flags and stuck. The weather went down, sighing before the stem. I lay down across her with my face in her breasts and my hand on her. We lay there without moving, but under us all moved and moved us gently up and down and from side to side. Past midnight, Never knew. Just been listening to that stupid bastard I took myself for 30 years ago. Hard to believe I was ever as bad as that. Well, thank God that's all done with anyway. The eyes she had. Everything there. Everything. All the... Everything there. Everything on this old muck ball. All the light and dark and famine and feasting of the... Ages. Yes. Let that go. Shh. Take his mind off his homework. Jesus. Oh, well. Maybe he was right. Maybe he was right. Ah. Nothing to say. Not a squeak. What's a year now? The sour cud and the iron stool. Reveled in the word school. School. 
happiest moment of the past half million. Seventeen copies sold, of which eleven at trade price to free circulating libraries beyond the sea. Getting no one pound six and something. Eight, I have little doubt. Crawled out once or twice before the summer was cold. Sat shivering in the park. Round and green. And burning to be gone. Not a soul. Last. Fancy. She ran under. Called the eyes out of me reading Effie again. Page a day with tears again. Effie. Could have been happy with her up there on the Baltic, in the pine, in the dune. Could I? And she, there. Fanny came in a couple of times, bony old ghost of a whore. Couldn't do much, but I suppose better than a kick in the crack. Last time wasn't so bad. How do you manage it, she said, at your age? I told her I'd been saving up for her all my life. Went to Vespers once, like when I was in short trousers. Now the day is over. Night is drawing nigh. Shadow <coughs> of the evening. Steal across the sky. Went to sleep and fell off the pew. Sometimes wandered in the night if a last effort mightn't. Ah, finish your booze now and get to your bed. Go on with this drivel in the morning or leave it at that. Leave it at that. Lie propped up in the dark and wander. Be again in the dingle on the Christmas Eve, gathering holly, the red berry. Be again on Crawford on a Sunday morning in the haze with the bitch. Stop and listen to the bell. And so on. Be again. Be. Again, all that old misery once wasn't enough for you. Lie down across her. I said again I thought it was hopeless and no good going on, and she agreed without opening her eye. I asked her to look at me, and after a few moments, after a few moments she did, but the eyes just slits because of the glare. I bent over her to get him in the shadow, and they opened. Let me in. We drew.
drifted in among the flags and stuck. The weather went down, sighing before the stem. I lay down across her with my face in her breasts and my hand on her. We lay there without moving, but under us all moved and moved us gently up and down and from side to side. Past midnight, never knew such silence. The earth might be uninhabited. Here I end this reading. Box three, spool five. Perhaps my best years are gone when there was a chance of happening. But I wouldn't want them back. Not with the fire in me now. No. I wouldn't want them back. A. Joe was Beckett's first play to be written for television. This production, supervised by Beckett himself, was first shown in 1966. Joe is played by Jack McGowan, who always seemed instinctively and physically ideal to interpret many of Beckett's characters. Jack McGowan died 17 years ago on the 31st of January, and so this showing becomes not only a tribute to a great playwright, but also a celebration of his collaboration with this fine actor.
Joe. Joe. Thought of everything. Forgotten nothing. You're all right now, eh? No one can see you now. No one can get at you now. Why don't you put out that light? There might be a louse watching you. Why don't you go to bed? What's wrong with that bed, Joe? You changed it, didn't you? Made no difference. Or is it the heart already? Crumbles when you lie down in the dark. Dry, rotten at last. Hey, Joe. The best's to come, you said that last time, hurrying me into my court. Last I was favored with from you. The best's to come. Say it you now, Joe, no one will hear you. Come on, Joe, no one can say it like you. Say it again now and listen to yourself. The best's to come. You are right for once. In the end. You know that penny-farthing hell you call your mind? That's where you think this is coming from, don't you? That's where you heard your father. Isn't that what you told me? Started in on you one June night and went on for years. On and off. Behind the eyes. That's how you were able to throttle him in the end. Mental fuggy, you called it. One of your happiest fancies. Mental thuggy. Otherwise, he'd be plaguing you yet. Then your mother, when her hour came. Look up, Joe. Look up. We're watching you. Weaker and weaker till you laid her too. Others. All the others. Such love he got. God knows why. Pitying love, none to touch it. And look at him now, throttling the dead in his head. Anyone living love you now, Joe? Anyone living sorry for you now? That slut that comes on Saturday, you pay her, don't you? Penny a hoist, tuppence as long as you like. Watch yourself, you don't run short, Joe. Ever think of that? Hey, Joe, what did it be if you ran out of us? Not another soul to still. Sit there in his stinking old wrapper, hearing himself. That lifelong adore. Weaker and weaker till not a gasp left there either. Is it that you want? Well preserved for his age and the silence of the grave. That old paradise you are always harping on. No, Joe. Not for the likes of us. I was strong myself when I started. In on you. Wasn't I, Joe? Normal strength. Like those summer evenings in the green. In the early days of our idyll. When we sat watching the ducks. Holding hands, exchanging vows. How you admired my elocution. Among other charms, voice like flint glass, to borrow your expression. Powerful grasp of language you had. Flint glass. You could have listened to it forever. And now this, squeezed down to this. How much longer would you say? Till the whisper. You know, when you can't hear the words. Just the odd one here and there. That's the worst. Isn't it, Joe? 
Isn't that what you told me? Before we expire, the odd word, straining to hear. Why is that, Joe? Why must you do that when you're nearly home? What matter, then, what we mean? It should be the best. Nearly home again, another stilled. And it's the worst. Isn't that what you said? The whisper, the odd word, straining to hear, brain tired squeezing. It stops in the end. You stop it in the end.